Hi everyone. I'm here today on Water Day 322-22 with scientist biophysicist William Brown. And as many of you know, William Brown works with Nassim Harriman in their laboratory, uh, Taurus Tech. And William, with his biophysics background, has done a lot of research looking at water and its effects on living systems. And they've, they've developed, as many of you know, the arc crystal and, and looked at the effects that the arc crystal has on water and then therefore treated water on plants and other types of systems and arrays of arc crystals like the tetrahelix. So there's very exciting results that they've seen with looking at the tetra water passing through the tetrahelix and its effects on plants and other systems. And they've done a lot of physical chemistry type research on water. But they've also done a lot of the theoretical modeling. So theoretical modeling, um, looking at water's role with the origin of life and now water's role with brain function and water's role with bioenergetics, which is really one of my very favorite topics. And so today we're going we're gonna to look at that and talk about that. Um, Nassim has written some incredible new physics along with his, his um, scientific part partner, Olivier, and they're, they're starting to apply their mathematical formulas to um, the human body. And, and William Brown here has been very involved in that. And it turns out water plays an enormous role as an interface and as a conductor of energy and information. And so in the human body with regard to energy production and our interaction with the unified field. So this is an opportunity for all of us to geek out a little bit and really dive in deep. And so I'm gonna just let you, one of the most brilliant biophysicists I've ever met, take the floor. And so go ahead, William, just let us know what you've been doing. Well, thank you, Beth. Uh, it's great to be uh, speaking with you and um, really excited to share some of this information, uh, our, our latest work on uh, Water Day here. Um, so uh, as you had described, uh, Nassim and Olivier uh, have been, uh, finishing their uh, two-year-long uh, round-the-clock work on a uh, unified physics, a model of unified physics um, that is probably one of the most uh, comprehensive solutions uh, I've seen. Uh, that, so it's one of the most comprehensive solutions that's been produced uh, to date. Um, and it's uh, very exciting because we're at the point in the development of the theory of the mathematics, the solutions, uh, that we can start to see how it applies to the functioning of the biological system. So we can start to apply some of the mathematics. Uh, th there's uh, thermodynamic equations. There's uh, equations for uh, uh, phase transitions of matter. Uh, so like uh, crystalline phases, um, liquid phases, amorphous phases, these kind of things, uh, which actually uh, become very pertinent when you're thinking about water and uh, it's uh, different, the different kind of phase transi transitions it can have, uh, particularly the uh, liquid crystalline phase, mm -hmm. which is uh, very interesting. Uh, but so, you know, uh, we've been able to start applying uh, some of these uh, mathematics uh, to the study of the biophysics, uh, in particular, uh, a, a new bioenergetics of the cell. Uh, so looking uh, at the molecular level of the energy production and utilization of the cellular system. And are you talking primarily right now about the energy production in the mitochondria? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, that that is the the star player when it mm -hmm. comes to uh, bioenergetics. So um, uh, veritably, all of the uh, cellular energy that uh, allows us to 
live and thrive and function uh, moment to moment, day to day, uh, it's coming from the energy production occurring in the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. uh, and this hit, hit little, it's a, a subcellular organelle uh, for folks that don't know. So, you know, within each one of your cells, you can have anywhere from 100 to 1000 mitochondria. And it's just this uh, extremely dynamic living system within the cell. Yeah. Um, you know, it, and I think it's good for the, our viewers to note, uh, to learn that at one point, these were bacteria. And they, they in the, at some point in our evolution, they moved intracellular and, and then became part of our cells. And now they function as an intracellular organelle. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, owing to that uh, bacterial ancestry, you know, so that they're, they're uh, uh, at some point, you know, they were essentially uh, um, endosymbionts of the cell. Mm -hmm. uh, you, they, you can, when you look at them, like in live microscopy, you can, it almost seems like they do still kind of have a mind of their own. Uh, really? <laughs> you know, you they move see, around, like kind yeah. of swarm around like bacteria. Yeah, yeah. So, I know. Yeah, it's super it, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, very about. dynamic. And they have the same kind of DNA as, as bacteria. So mm -hmm. it's very different than our, you know, double, well, it's very different than our DNA. It's circular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, a cir circular plasmid. Um, and, uh, you know, it's only about 1,500 base pairs long compared to our uh, 3 billion <laughs> uh, <laughs> long um, genomes. Um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, the. There's a lot of interesting things that can be said about uh, the uh, DNA, yeah, uh, as well. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, just that uh, it's very interesting because having a more bacterial-like genome, uh, they don't have any uh, of the what we call like non-protein coding gene segments. So, like uh, mobile genetic elements, uh, highly repetitive DNA elements. So, you know. 98% uh, or more of our genome are, are these non-protein coding gene segments. Yeah. Um, but so like the mitochondrial genome and bacterial genomes as well are just like extremely streamlined. So they're, they're much smaller where it's mostly just genes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just the stuff that, that is necessary for their form and function. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so... Uh, within the mitochondria, we have uh, the energy production, which is the production of ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate, uh, which is, uh, it's actually a, a nucle uh, nucleotide, a nucleoside, uh, uh, adenosine mm -hmm. is one of the uh, nucleotides uh, for the base pair of DNA. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in terms of cellular bioenergetics, uh, it is the, the currency of energy. Um, so just about every energetic process taking place um, in the cell um, and in the body is uh, occurring via uh, exchanges or um, the, the uh, transfer of the uh, phosphate groups of the ATP. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, in mitochondria, what you have occurring is uh, the transduction of energy. Uh, so it, the conversion of energy from one form to another. So like a it, transformer. Like uh, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So uh, the mitochondria are using water uh, to form a electrochemical gradient. Uh, so that's electro electrical potential energy. Mm -hmm. And then it can convert that electrochemical potential energy into mechanical energy. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, kinetic energy. Is that and, spinning the router? The yeah, that's that's the rotor. The router. That's the motor. Yeah. I think it's really important. I don't want to interrupt you, but it's important for people to note that within the mitochondria, you have these routers that at one point in a conversation I had with you, William, you said is spinning at the same rate as a jet engine. Um, that's like spinning the protons across the membrane 
right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when it's just humming along, it's at about uh, 8,000 to 10,000 RPM, which is mm -hmm. a, a jet engine, the, the, the rotational rate of a jet engine. Mm -hmm. uh, it, in some of our calculations, we've shown that um, at particular pH gradients, electrochemical potentials, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, it is formed by grabbing protons from the liquid crystalline water matrix in the mitochondria mm -hmm. uh, at particular pH gradients that can get as high as 60,000 RPM, 1,000 revolutions per second. Okay, let's put this in perspective for a minute. This is extraordinary. So that's like, that would be way faster than the fastest jet on the planet yeah. like by like what five times yes and yeah. um how many of these routers do you have on one mitochondria so uh if you were to look inside the mitochondria so the, the mitochondria are a uh, double-celled uh organelle uh so they've got double a membrane a double membrane yeah uh, organelle so uh they've got a, a outer membrane uh which is in the cytosol of your cell Mm -hmm. uh, and then they have a inner membrane. Uh, in the inner membrane, it's highly infolded. Yep. Uh, so it, it actually resembles a lot like the, the sulky and gyria, the neocortex of the yes, brain. Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. Which I, I don't think is coincidental. No. Uh, you know, <laughs> Definitely uh, not. Yeah. And, and that kind of starts to speak to some of the roles of the mitochondria in uh, information transduction uh, in, in the cell. It, it um, is also somewhat the brain. That's right. Of the cell. Um, now, uh, that, that high degree of uh, folding of the inner membrane uh, gives it a large surface area, uh, much larger than if it was just um, a, a simple spherical uh, membrane. The reason for that is uh, it can fit a lot more of those rotors, those mm -hmm. ATP synthase um, enzymes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, catalytic converters, <laughs> all yep. along that inner membrane. Uh, and also it, it forms uh, little compartments called uh, cristae yep. uh, inside. And yeah. it, uh, if you look at that inner membrane uh, through like an, an electron microscope, you can just see it, it's studded with these ATPase uh, enzymes. Okay, so you've got thousands of these within the inner membrane of one mitochondrion, yeah. you have sometimes multiple thousands mitochondria within a cell. Each one of these can be rotating at jet engine speeds or five times that. And it's the water that's driving it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the critical thing to say <laughs> on water day. Hello, we're 99% water by number of molecules and the water is driving this. And so talk about how this plugs us into the whole matrix of the unified field and allows for the exchange of energy from the field itself. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's like a water engine. Uh, yeah, because, it's, I've always said it's like a free energy engine. Just <laughs> plug it in there. Yeah, yeah, because um, you know the the water uh, is what's supplying uh, the protons to form that electrochemical gradient, mm -hmm. uh, which forms the proton motor force that allows the rotor to convert um, a, electromechanical energy mm -hmm. into chemical bond energy, the ATP. Right. Uh, and when it does that, it produces. It regenerates, I should say, water. Uh, so um, yeah. it's kind of like water in, water out, um, you know. And then, uh, you know, oh, the oh, the, yeah. uh, the the free energy utilization, um, you know, th there's uh, the, the primary source uh, is from uh, pyruvate. Uh, so you know, um, it, it is using. Um, uh, the chemical bonds we get from food to produce high energy electrons uh, to pump those protons um, against their osmotic gradient uh, to produce that uh, electrochemical potential. Um, there are uh, um, some other possibilities. Um, it, it can drive uh, some of the ATP production just by being in sunlight. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, light absorption can cause um, uh, ATP uh, biosynthesis. 
Uh, and one of the things that we're looking at is uh, coupling with the energy structure of space time. That's what I, yeah, that's what we should talk about. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because yeah, uh, so uh, some of the mathematics that uh, Nassim and Olivier have been uh, writing to describe the uh, constitutive energetic fluctuations that are occurring all the time uh, in free space. Uh, that's also known as uh, the quantum vacuum fluctuations. Uh, so, um, you know, the uh, uh, vacuum kind of classically is empty and devoid of energy. Um, it's a true vacuum in that sense. But once you start applying quantum mechanics to it, quantum field theory, uh, you see that uh, empty space is not empty. Right. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, um, the physicist uh, John Archibald Wheeler said uh, that space, the vacuum, is the seat of the highest energy physics. Yep. Because um, uh, actually at, at the Planck scale, you have basically the highest energy vibrations oscillations that are allowable uh, before uh, the, the space collapse, collapses into a black hole. Wow. Uh, but but that's, that's so cool. I mean, you just think about the, the like, like, I love okay, it. I just want to back up for a second because sorry to interrupt, but you know, the size of a plonk to a human cell is the size of a human cell to the universe. So, so you have these little tiny things that are almost infinitely small and they're all like, they've got this particular kind of dynamic happening. They're all, they're all moving and vibrating. Then you have so many packed together. What's the number in a proton, for example, 10 to the 64? Well, uh, 10, 10 to the 80. In 10 the to the 80. <laughs> packed in there they're all doing their little gyrations that, that, that's as many protons as there are in the universe oh my 10 god 10 to the 80 10 yeah. to the 80 so i mean so yes it's the it's it's the most incredibly high energy state when you're going down at the quantum level and that's what we all that's where we're all birthed from like that's what we all derive from from this incredibly high energy state yeah. and uh so I think what the, the physics that are being written currently that will be published shortly really are going to talk about how do we interact with that that energy and and right here i've always been fascinated with the mitochondria and water like two favorite topics and it's like it, it's all coming together right here in this intersection of how water is playing this role in the mitochondria to really plug us into the 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 energy of the vacuum it's the interface it's the interface it's uh -huh. the interface for uh -huh. so much in the body i mean really it's the interface for everything um it's how our entire body is interacting with the unified field um but but i think also i wanted to ask you like you know how i go through went through medical school and it was i was taught your atp production depends on the glucose in your diet and the oxygen that you breathe and and then when you really do the math and i can't believe more people haven't crit like critically thought about this you don't there's no way in the world that you can eat enough food to to generate the mitochondria uh, to generate the atp that's literally required to fuel your body let alone if you're running a marathon or something like that yeah. right so now are you saying that it's really the water that that's supplying the energy for that? Yeah, yeah. Well, via, via coupling to the energetic structure, the, the energetic dynamic of space uh, that you just described, mm -hmm. uh, those uh, quantum energetic uh, fluctuations or oscillations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because I mean, uh, you know, if you're sitting around in a given day, you regenerate your body's weight in ATP. That's how much you're using just on baseline thermal processes uh, and, and maintenance processes of your body. Right. And then you run a marathon and you're generating tons. Yeah. Like, I think, yeah. what what is it, like two tons? It, it, it's uh, approximately a metric ton. Tons? <laughs> A metric ton. Oh my god! Yeah, a, th a thousand kilograms of ATP that, that you're regenerating. 
Wow. You know, so yeah, so you know, you've you've got the uh, uh, adenosine diphosphate. Um, you could think of it as like the the backbone, uh, and then what the mitochondria does is it puts a high energy phosphate group onto it. Uh, and just by the way, uh, the phosphate that it puts on there uh, is is quantum entangled. <laughs> so um, it actually, uh, yeah. ATP has been shown. Uh, by like mainstream physicists uh, to be a potential functional qubit, uh, a quantum bit. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but um, I need to hear more because <laughs> because that was bothering me too. Okay, because uh, where's all this coming from? So, so uh, we're yeah, sharing our phosphate. Like, is that what you're saying through the vacuum? Well, so. Uh, there's, um, it, it's, it's a uh, spin entanglement. Okay. Uh, so there's two elements primarily uh, in the body. Um, if you count uh, lithium six, there's three and lithium six uh, plays an important role, but there's, there's two uh, elements in the body that have a special spin state of the nuclei. One is the proton in water. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, water, when it's in the liquid crystalline phase, that's uh, how it exists in the cell, in the cellular system, uh, the protons there are delocalized. Mm -hmm. yeah. That means that they're being shared uh, with the oxygens. Uh, right. So, uh, right. you know, you, you have this... Um, uh, it's like of, a colloid or... Yeah. And it's um, this like uh, dynamic uh, equilibrium exchange between uh, um, H3O and OH um, yeah. with the, the protons moving around. Right. Uh, the protons, um, you know, they're, they have spin. Um, and uh, the, the spin that they have um, is a, a special state that uh, is very... Um, uh, weakly interacting with uh, ambient magnetic fields uh, and electrical fields. Uh, so if you have uh, two such protons in this water matrix that interact with each other, uh, they can become entangled and maintain that entangled state for uh, physiologically relevant time frames before decoherence occurs. Because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the um, body is compared to most quantum mechanical states, a high temperature system. Uh, the other element uh, that has this unique spin state is uh, phos phosphorus. Uh, it is the center of that phosphate group in ATP. Mm. So uh, you have uh, with ATP, that's uh, triphosphate, three phosphate groups uh, attached to the adenosine nucleoside. Uh, when the ATPase, the mitochondria, is putting that uh, phosphate group uh, onto ADP, uh, it's actually becoming quantum entangled with the phosphates on that ADP uh, because uh, the, the spin state uh, can become um, uh, quantum entangled. And it's long lasting uh, because of the uh, specific uh, spin of phosphorus um, it is very resistant to decoherence by uh, ambient magnetic and electrical fields. So, uh, a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'd all disappear. So yeah. this this uh, uh, ATP, uh, the mitochondria is generating all this quantum entangled ATP that's going out into the cell, going out into the intercellular system, and you can think of it as forming like this entanglement network. Yeah, with all these uh, uh, qubits, uh, and so um, a, a ATP molecule uh, leaves the mitochondria, goes to a uh, enzyme in the cell that's important for like uh, DNA replication, um, uh, even uh, um, mitosis of the cell, regulating aspects of mitosis of the cell, puts this quantum entangled phosphate group onto it. Now you've got a direct informational link between uh, the water matrix in the mitochondria that's coupled to the vacuum structure and 
physiological regulatory activities of the cell. Uh, so what we can begin to do is uh, form like a direct causal link of information uh, transduction. And you know, the, the mitochondria uh, is really, um, you know, it's a transducer. Uh, so it's uh, converting or, or transducing energy. Uh, and we believe in what we're starting to apply the mathematics to describe is also uh, um, transduction of information hmm. that goes hand in hand with the bioenergetics, uh, the, the generation of energy, uh, which as you pointed out, I really can't be fully accounted for by what you eat. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, especially when you consider like um, a fasting state, like 40 days. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. So I'm almost got the analogy just now of like, of like the mitochondria, we're getting plugged into the vacuum via the mitochondria and the water's like, the, the electrical wire. The, uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, so uh, one of the really interesting things about uh, some of the uh, mathematics that uh, Olivier and Nassim had developed is in describing that quantum vacuum fluctuation of space, uh, they're actually applying, oh, nice. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> That's some of our um, arc crystal structured water there. <laughs> um, but they're, they're actually um, applying some of the same mathematics that are used to describe phase transitions in water. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, say water going from the liquid to the crystalline phase, our liquid to solid phase. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, actually describe the uh, vacuum Planck plas plasma, uh -huh. uh, those energetic quantum harmonic oscillators, uh, with some of the same uh, mathematics for a phase transition. Yes. Well, and, it's, it's interesting because it's all pla they're all plasmas, right? Like, so you've got the 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 Planck plasma, and then water. You could almost describe like a plasma. Very, very much, yeah. very similar. I, I, I mean, um, you know, especially in the mitochondria. Uh, mm -hmm. where you've got these delocalized or free-ranging protons. Protons, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, in that intermembrane compartment of the mitochondria, you've got a high amount of free protons, almost like a plasma state. Yeah. And, and you know, that's what's uh, supplying the, the proton motive force to drive the ATP uh, rotor, the, the um, synthase. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's it's so cool. So so knowing what you're, you know, just with the, all this modeling that you guys are doing, where do you see it going from here? Like, this is what I think people are really going to want to know. So how does this benefit mm -hmm. me? Because yeah. I'm imagining that we're going to be able to design technologies to support health. Because really, as I've said so many times, like, like mitochondrial functioning and learning how to optimize that in, you know, in, in medicine is truly the holy grail because mitochondrial dysfunction is at the root of all diseases mm -hmm. and really at the root of aging. Yeah. It's like our mitochondria, you know, don't become dysfunctional as we age, we age as our mitochondria become dysfunctional well said and so it's like we now are so close to really cracking the code on and maybe we on how to optimize mitochondrial function and we, we have some good technologies so already that are really a game changers for my patients you know like the the near infrared light therapies mm -hmm. the red light therapies and NADIVs that I'm doing in the clinic and you know of course the nutrients we've been working with for some time peptides to kind of enhance coupling of of cardiolipin you know with the membrane and and so there's a lot that we have but it's just the tip of the iceberg of what's possible like what I'm envisioning one day is someone being able to step into a chamber and it's somehow like 
aligns the mitochondria with the with the vacuum, pl plugs us in in a more efficient way. What do you see for the future? Very similar to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, you know, you you have all these spin dynamics um, that that are uh, central to this uh, the the bioenergetics of uh, the mitochondrial ATP production and functionality. Uh, so uh, spinning of the uh, protons in the water, um, uh, spinning of the proton-like plasma in the intermembrane compartment, uh, coupling um, like a transformer, uh, like an inductor uh, to the spinning rotor of the ATPase, the ATP uh, synthase enzyme. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's possible to have like a spin to spin coupling. Uh, so with like a, a spinning plasma um, to produce a, uh, like a circularly, circularly polarized um, electromagnetic field with like highly coherent yes. uh, spin orientation. Um, and what we hope to do is um, by uh, fully characterizing uh, these uh, spin state of the ATP synthase, uh, its energetic flux and uh, transduction of energy uh, from the electrochemical potential energy uh, to the chemical bond energy in ATP, uh, we could produce um, a system that can couple to that. Uh, and really, the you know, in the in the mitochondrial intermembrane, this is a super complex of ATPases um, and you, you know like uh, the potential to synchronize them all because um, uh, uh, synchronize all their um, uh, uh, spin mm -hmm. states uh, so that uh, the efficiency of um, ATP production uh, goes to like a hundred percent you know because uh, the the ATPase uh, it is a very interesting thermodynamic system in that it converts that energy already uh, from uh, the, the mechanical kinetic energy of the spin to ATP synthesis. Mm -hmm. It has a hundred percent efficient energy transfer. <laughs> you huh. know, uh, in terms of like thermodynamics, that that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that needs to be explained. Oh, it's a miracle. It's yeah, a miracle. yeah, and you know, I, I think that uh, that's another area where we'll be able to explain how that uh, is uh, uh, able to occur via the coupling with the vacuum structure. Right. I think that. Basically, if we can optimize coupling with the vacuum structure, then there is the appropriate exchange of, of energy mm. to maintain mm -hmm. the physiology and to reduce entropy. Yeah, so it, it, yeah. They just must, right in that area, there must be such great coherency. It allows for this kind of perfect functioning. And, and you know, uh, so the, the energetic state of the mitochondria is also for it an informational state. And so, you know, it can tell the mitochondria uh, whether or not uh, it needs to um, multiply, um, you know, uh, have the cell uh, multiply, or it can be a signal to the mitochondria to like undergo uh, apoptosis. I know. Yeah. Like that's the thing. It's like what happens as we, at it, well, we age because this happens, but what tends to happen as we age chronologically is that you just have more and more and more mitochondria that are slightly damaged that are just not working as well. And really you need to trigger mitophagy, which is like, yeah, the cell to recognize that and kill that one and then make a uh -huh. new one that's yeah. like that's bigger and and more robust and you know pristine so that it can then function at kind of this youthful level yeah. and well, well even uh parallel to that um getting rid of uh senescent cells mm -hmm. you know a, a huge part of aging is the accumulation of these uh, senescent cells yeah. that just sit there and pump out inflammatory cytokines yeah. <laughs> essentially toxins uh and they're you know they're not fully functional cells right the mitochondria tell those cells to 
go away. Uh, apoptosis. <laughs> yeah. Like one, it's really equally important, you know, to, to, to birthing a new cell is to killing a bad one yeah. in the yeah. body yeah. in order to stay healthy. And yeah, that's where yeah. some of these practices come in to the, into the play. These mm. study practices of like caloric restriction mm -hmm. and intermittent yeah. fasting and ketogenic diets and things that, that kind of remind the body to, to kind of like clean up the old stuff and birth the new. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, uh, we have technologies in mind to, to, for, uh, under development to, to uh, more strongly couple mm -hmm. uh, the body via the mitochondria, via the water matrix in the mitochondria to that information energy structure, especially the coherent phases mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, quantum vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, and by doing that, uh, you know, it, it'll increase cellular vitality, mm -hmm. which is part and parcel with increasing uh, correct intercellular signaling about cellular regulation. Yes. You know, for rejuvenation uh, purposes. And, uh, you know, the um, our, crystal, our crystal water uh, is kind of the first iteration in that technology. And, uh, and you can totally tell the difference with this water. I, mm -hmm. this is what I drink all day. Love it. Yeah. And, you know, since, since I've been uh, getting into some of the, the, the modeling and so, writing some of the mathematics for the, the energy production in the mitochondria, it just has me like super cognizant every time I'm, I'm uh, re reaching for uh, the, the, the water to drink it, uh, you know, just the, the understanding that that water that I'm drinking, you know, a good portion of it is going into the mitochondria and that water is uh, going to be incorporated into that crystalline matrix inside oh, the matrix right. of the mitochondria and it's going to be supplying the protons that are driving that atp production those those atpase enzymes yeah. uh, so, so you know it's like um this uh even as a, a first iteration technology is already helping to augment the coupling of the mitochondria to that energy transduction system yeah and i think it, and we've talked a lot about how the water serving as a substrate with these kind of protons delivering these protons but i also just want to re-emphasize that when we're replete with water in the body our whole body is like a liquid crystal mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and i feel that that in that acts like an interface it it acts like an amplifying conduit between our biology and the energy and information in the unified field. Yes. So, so yeah. it just, just again, on water day, I want to emphasize that, that one of the most important things you can do for your health is drink water and drink the right water, ideally purified and structured water that's been energized, you know, something like, like with the arc crystal here, um, because you want to ideally be drinking half your body weight in ounces of water every day. And I can completely tell who does that and who doesn't do that when in my medical practice. And just even when I'm walking down the street, it's so evident. Um, and you will feel better, you will think better, you will have greater meditations, you will have less pain in your body, you're, you will have fewer toxins in your body, your immune system works better, everything works better. And you've kind of related to our discussion today, you're just going to have more energy. You know, it's going to help you feel uh, plugged in to the field as you should. It's like, it's like plugging into a, an electric outlet. And if you can start with liquid crystalline water going in, you know, it's, it's going uh, to make it all, all the much more easy for your body to, to form that liquid crystalline quantum coherent state. Inside. That, yeah it yeah sounds, because it yeah. takes energy it takes energy mm -hmm. to structure the water whether it's outside your body or structure it inside your body so if you're pulling into your body water that's already kind of taken that energy to form structure whether it lasts as it's passing through your digestive acids and everything when it goes into the body in its structured state or not is almost irrelevant because it the, the energy that was required to structure the water outside your body gets communicated to your physiology once it's inside. So it's really critical to drink structured water if you can, if you can, and there's multiple ways to structure water. So 
I'm sure there'll be a lot of people talking today about different ways to structure water. But William, this is such a great conversation and you know, this will appeal to the, the scientifically minded people here and hopefully to everyone just to kind of distill out the salient points of, you know, we are, we are derived from this field of energy and information and our health depends on our degree of resonance with this field and water plays a huge role in that. And you and Nassim and Olivier are writing the math and kind of modeling how this water is actually doing that. And it's just so fun to learn. So thank you. And I can't wait to see the technologies that spin out of this. And I think, I think we'll be sharing more about these technologies in the coming months. Oh, well, I, I certainly look forward to uh, um, further uh, discussions with you about uh, as the technologies develop and as uh, some of our work develop. Awesome. You're one of my favorite people to talk to, William. Thank, oh, thank you so you. much for coming on. Okay. Take care. Say hi to everyone over at Tours Tech. Take care. Bye.